What's up everybody? We're not doing a book review today, but going over just the first section, volume one of the complete Golden Dawn System of Magic by Israel Regardi. I think it's important to note that the original gray papers were released in 1937, and what we have here is a paperback, black and white version of the evolution of these works. I came across it by what I call just following the breadcrumbs from book to book and discovering new things. I would say Dion Fortune and some of her works had a lot to do with it. I've read five of her books and of course she was a member of the order and I wanted to know more about it. I wasn't sure whether I was going to gear this video towards those who were already familiar with the subject or those who had no idea, but I think it's presented in a way where either way you'll find this interesting and there will be some things in here that we cover of value. So once again, this isn't a comprehensive study of this system or book. We're only going over volume one, but I think it's a great place to start. There's some gems in here. I hand selected them. I put in some slides and some video to accompany the material. And without further ado, let's dive in. Studying the metaphysical or other esoteric teachings, you find yourself in a very abstract world. I liken it to swimming in deep waters. While there's a lot of bells and whistles that you can forego, there's a few things that shouldn't be skipped, like a sound vessel to die from, and an inner stability that you can maintain at will once in. It reminds me of Dion Fortune, who advocated the approach of subjective reality in an objective way. It doesn't surprise me when Israel Regardi, who was initiated into the same order as her, seemed to share that sentiment. In fact, he pretty much opens up this whole magnum opus of his with a quote from President Calvin Coolidge as follows. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was founded in 1887 to formulate in England a semi-public occult organization which was to employ an elaborate magical ceremonial, Kabbalistic teaching, and a comprehensive scheme of spiritual training. Its teachings are based on the magic of the Egyptians, in which the Hebrew Pentateuch tells you that Moses, the founder of the Jewish system was learned, that is, in which he had been initiated. The prominent adepti of the Golden Dawn received their knowledge and power from predecessors of equal or even greater eminence. They received and have handed down their doctrine and system of theosophy and hermetic science and the higher alchemy from a long series of practical investigators whose origin is traced to the College of the Rosy Cross otherwise known as the Rosicrucians in Germany. When talking about the Golden Dawn or the Western mystery tradition in general, one powerful and sometimes controversial figure who will come up is Aleister Crowley. Israel Regardi worked under Crowley for several years, and I think it's interesting to hear his take on the magnetic yet sometimes infamous figure, depending on who you ask. Regardi says, Crowley tampered unnecessarily with the grade rituals, so that their beauty as well as practical worth was gone. Perhaps his aim was to eliminate important parts of the rites and practical work so that interested people, realizing that more information was required, would communicate with him for further guidance, thus enabling him to consolidate his position as a leader and formulate an act of order. However, Regardi goes on to state, if the breaking of a sacred obligation is justified, as occasionally it is, it is only so when the matter covered by that oath is revealed in a dignified matter. In such an event, the oath is neither betrayed nor profaned. Further on, he says, unless one has first studied magic from a more comprehensible and reliable source, most of what Crowley has written will be in the main unintelligible. Hmm. So this is interesting. On one hand, Regardi is saying, yeah, Crowley betrayed the oath. He didn't live a very moral life. You know, maybe he didn't represent the order in the best of light. Yet on the other, he's saying, 
Did he really betray the oath when he really didn't give the full recipe? It's definitely some food for thought, and I think it's kind of revealing to Regardi's opinion on the release of Inner Secrets, if you will. But for now, we're going to put that aside and continue to the next topic which caught my attention, and that is the idea of initiation with these orders. Initiation means to begin, to start something new. It represents the beginning of a new life dedicated to an entirely different set of principles from those of what William Reich once contemptuously termed homo normalis. Regardi further explains initiation with, those who were in need of the teaching and work would inevitably be attracted to some of the order's members and undergo initiation. When the time comes for the inner awakening as it may be called, all sorts of synchronicities, as Jung might call them, occur which lead them inevitably in the right direction, to the Western esoteric tradition. Okay, the reason I included that is not because the idea of initiation into a secret order or semi-secret order is something new, but this broader idea that I've been playing with and that's following a set of synchronicities into something that you would least expect something like you know you have side a of the album but then you have side b you know the lesser known and that's often where the, the gems are the lesser known tracks uh i like the way regardy put it i like the idea of uh leaving it broad and saying western esoteric tradition he wasn't just saying golden dawn i think he wrote this for a western audience and i think it could even go beyond that just it's a general philosophy those looking for a deeper meaning simply need the right eyes. So when the phone rings, pick it up, initiation. And the next gem, something that doesn't get talked about enough. And that's the idea that throughout history, we shared ideas with each other, you know, as people mixed, whether it be through trade routes or in this next example's case, uh, conquest. When ideas mix, people realize we're not so different. Sometimes we're talking about the same thing and oftentimes we could get ideas from the next person. So this next section is talking about the impact of Islamic culture on the Western world. At one point it must be recalled that the Arabs had invaded Europe and had virtually conquered a part if not all of Spain. They brought with them not merely a victorious army but Islamic culture as well. That includes mathematics, though it is well to reflect on what this one item alone did to European knowledge, but in addition, the Greek classics and literature from Aristotle on. Their contribution included alchemy, astrology, and the other occult arts. Above all, it brought Islamic mysticism, Sufism. This was taken from bbc.com.uk, actually. Islamic Spain was a multicultural mix of the people, of three great monotheistic religions, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Although Christians and Jews lived under restrictions, for much of the time the three groups managed to get along together, and to some extent to benefit from the presence of each other. It brought a degree of civilization to Europe that matched the heights of the Roman Empire and the later Italian Renaissance. Okay, so that's no major revelation to some. I don't know if I just wasn't paying attention back in school or if that dynamic wasn't emphasized enough. Can't verify, but it keeps popping up even in my secular books. And I'm like, man, I feel like that whole situation doesn't get enough credit. So in maintaining this theme of different ideas coming together and melting together in this big pot that we know as the Western esoteric tradition, which by the way is an umbrella term, what Rigardi was trying to get at here was uh, there are certain ingredients that are pretty much standard. And with that said, we're going to jump to the next ingredient, the influence that the exiled Jews had in Spain during a certain time period. Furthermore, what must not be forgotten was that a favorable climate was also being evolved for the wandering and exiled Jewish people to flourish in. They contributed enormously to Spanish culture, scientific knowledge, and at the same time, a specific Hebrew mysticism was taking shape and form. This included some of the pre-Zoharic literature, as well as some of the greatest names in Kabbalistic history. 
Okay, so that was basically on influences that make up the Western esoteric tradition. I pulled out a couple influences that were already identified. Obviously, there's more like Hermeticism in the Greek and the Egyptian mysteries. But we're going to switch gears real quick and focus on something that Regardi included as a cautionary note to those taken on the inner paths. Israel Regardi spent decades working in and teaching the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn system. And one thing that he noticed was certain pathologies that tended to pop up commonly in students. The first common problem is the confusion between the Freudian superego and the order's concept of the higher and divine genius. Regardi says, The person takes the impersonal and universal nature of the powers he or she experiences as if he or she created the powers or experiences by what they call themselves. If this experience called by Jung the man of personality persists for too long a period, the person becomes egomaniacal and thoroughly self-centered. The second problem comes from what Regardi identifies as a distorted view of sexuality, where he says, There is a danger of the blatant acting out of instincts which have been distorted through repression and denial on the one hand, or their compulsive repression leading to a boring and unfulfilled sex life. Those involved in the great work have often found themselves falling into one camp of excess in one direction or another. He believes that the proper use and enjoyment of sex is a necessary part of the discovery and development of the higher genius. And last but not least, although it wasn't included in this section on hurdles involving the great work, Regardi did address the problem that he saw in the notion that the Golden Dawn system was solely based off the simple performance of dry rituals and nothing more. He counters that with the emphasis that there's actual skills that need to be mastered, where the rituals serve more or less as mental aids for the greater understanding that should accompany them. Hmm, that's pretty deep. A lot of the writers that I read come from this time period, you know, the uh, first half of the 20th century. It seems a lot of them put this, maybe it's just me, a lot of them put this emphasis on clinical psychology and it makes sense because these systems of self-mastery and esoteric orders put an emphasis on introspection, knowing thyself, as the fam famous axiom says. Don't let me butcher it though. Let's see what Regardi had to say in taking on some of these pathologies while engaged in the great work. Regardi said, to obtain the greatest benefit from magic, which is, as it were, a postgraduate study, there should be some undergraduate work in personal therapy. The dividends are enormous. I have insisted that the serious magical students seek a course in therapy as a safeguard against some of the catastrophic results which appear to overtake too many of our promising students. Joe is part of a team, headed by a psychiatrist, that is constantly trying to speed this recovery which otherwise might take a lifetime or might never occur at all. Along with some psychotherapy and physical therapy, along with the occupational, recreational and industrial therapy, there is also the symptherapy of being treated with respect, day in and day out, by the one sane person in the ward. Time and patience. It was apparently the intent of the founders not to provide a finished system of philosophy, such as the secret doctrine of Blavatsky and etc. It was intended to be supplemented by further reading, study, meditation, and of course by scrying. In this way, the magical language and in turn the philosophy could be developed on an individual basis. Yeah, that last part really resonated with me. Um, it brings me back to something I've been thinking about lately, and that's the idea that there's seven and a half billion people on this planet, each with their own unique fingerprint. Who's to say that their path, as it pertains to finding the higher, is not gonna be equally unique? I like that the Golden Dawn, as Regardi is trying to express it, wants to give the individual complete autonomy. While the system lacks some of the pitfalls of heavy constraints, there is a working lexicon, and I think that's what Volume 1 is kind of about. That's why it's entitled The Magical Alphabet. Now, I'm not going to break down the individual ingredients. Some of them, like Kabbalah, you could take a lifetime to study, 
but I'm gonna pick one that caught my eye that's actually within Kabbalah, and that's the Tetragrammaton. We're gonna go over that and close the video with Regari's opinion on what it takes to succeed in this system. Otherwise, thanks for rocking with me. More videos coming. The next section that caught my eye was the explanation of the Tetragrammaton. Now, the Tetragrammaton means the four-lettered name for the traditional God of the Old Testament. It represents the Hebrew letters of yod heh vav -He. but it is commonly said that no one knows the exact pronunciation of the name. McGregor Mather states in Kabbalah Unveiled, I myself know some score of different mystical pronunciations of it, and it is a secret of secrets. He who can rightly pronounce it causeth heaven and earth to tremble, for it is the name which rusheth through the universe. Therefore, when a devout Jew comes upon it in reading the scripture, he either does not attempt to pronounce it, but instead makes a short pause, or else he substitutes it for another name, Adonai, meaning Lord. The radical meaning of the word is to be, and it is thus like Eheye, a glyph of existence. The Tetragrammaton is capable of 12 transpositions, which all convey the meaning of to be. They are called the 12 banners of the mighty name. There are three other tetragrammatic names, which are Eheye, meaning existence, Adonai, meaning Lord, and Agala. The last is not properly speaking a word, but a notericon of the sentence. Atto, Gibor, Leolam, Adonai. Thou art mighty forever, O Lord. In wrapping up what I took from Israel Regardi's complete Golden Dawn system of magic, he speaks on elitism regarding the order in saying, It is to be elitist in the strictest sense of the term, appealing primarily to those with the highest qualifications and capabilities in all aspects and developments of modern life. The lame, the halt, the effete, and inept will not find a favorable environment for their foibles here. Are you okay? I think you need to sit down, Tom, because what was happening there was very next level. You should have seen your face. Do you want a beer? Are you feeling better? What happened? I'm supposed to dig. <laughs>